Hi, Misha here. And, uh, really there has not been much new in the gun world to talk about, unfortunately. Some good deals, but as far as the guns themselves, not really much. Well, recently we published a video that Jay did on his kind of ranking of his mostly 9mm subcaliber guns, top 13. And he suggested that I try a couple of list videos, so this is going to be my first effort. I'm going to talk about my top six favorite FN FAL derivatives. And all of these will be in 7.62 NATO, often called 308. So, starting with number 6 and working our way up to number 1, we will have the Austrian STG 58. This is a kit build, as all in the US are, except for maybe a handful of one-offs. Austria themselves never sent over a semi-auto STG-58. However, pretty much the next best thing is uh, DSA. They bought most of the production line, tooling, blueprints, know-how, they might have even bought a couple of guys named Hans and Fritz. And they bought a boatload of parts. Basically, literally so. And that's really how DSA got started. So if you want a semi-auto receiver made as close to Austrian spec as possible, you get yourself a, a DSA. And so if you want an authentic STG-58, <clears throat> the best way to go about is get yourself a parts kit, which years ago they were actually very common in America, and build it on a DSA receiver. I'll see a lot of people doing Imbel receivers with these back in the day, because those were also very cheap and affordable. But to me, that slab side Type 3 look... Eh, I just, inbound receiver is a great receiver, it has its purpose, but I like a Type 1, or in this case, a Type 2. The STG-58, not surprisingly, was adopted in 1958 by the Austrians. It was a take on the German G1 variant, but it had a few unique features. The first 20,000 or so were built in Belgium by FN, and then they obtained a license to build them there at Steyr. The early guns would be assembled by Steyr from Belgian parts. Later guns would be totally Steyr made, and uh, that's really where the barrel reputation comes in. STG 58s, the common wisdom is that they have the best, most accurate barrels. They typically did not chrome line, although you'll find later ones with chrome plated chambers, but it wasn't until very late in production they went to a full chrome bore. You'll find parts kits either blued or phosphated. Typical 21 inch, relatively light profile barrel. One of the more unique features of this critter is the, let me get it more in the light for you, I think, is the Stoll flash hider, which doubles as a grenade launcher, and it has internal threads for a blank fire device. There's no bayonet lug. The Austrian military has not used bayonets in quite some time. We have a solid front sight base with the short rear sight. We have the metal handguard with a folding light bipod. We have a folding carry handle, pretty standard. The original guns would have a wood stock, but later Steyr would go to this very unique polymer stock. And the rest of it is standard FAL. They take standard FAL mags. 
and they used a sling very similar to a Carabiner 98. So this is my number six because I really like how it looks and also my very first FAO that a friend helped me put together was built on an STG 58 parts kit that's not this one that one we built built on a Kunin receiver back in the early 2000s uh, it got traded off somewhere along the way but this one was built by a different friend and when he needed some coin I ended up picking it up off of him and uh, I like it and they were really good kits they came in mostly in excellent shape today they're kind of pricey but back in the day an STG 58 kit was a great kit to get because you knew it would have a great bore and usually the rest of the parts were in very nice shape as well so it was kind of one of the higher end kit build options then but it is a kit build not a factory import so with that in mind really can't rank it any higher than uh, number six but hey it made the list and uh, they're a lot of fun to shoot they are quite accurate for an FAL bipods neat metal hand guards while they do get hot are also just kind of cool and who doesn't like the stole flash hider I tell you who doesn't communists well we'll move on alrighty Moving along, number five. The Austrian, or excuse me, Australian, <laughs> it's late guys, Lithgow L2A1. This is the squad automatic, the LMG, this. SAW version known in Europe originally is the FALO FALO and this is a unique design to Australia and to some extent Canada because their C2, C2A1 is a very similar pattern essentially it's the same basic FAO on the back except we have a unique rear sight that's mounted on the top cover rather than the lower frame we have a unique carry handle, a little different sand cut bolt very cool bipod maybe not terribly practical but it doubles as a handguard when folded up heavy very heavy still 21 inch though barrel, exposed gas tube we have the tall front sight with removable side ears in case they got damaged. And then we have a more or less standard L1A1 flash rider with bayonet lug. The pistol grip and buttstock are pretty well standard too. This was manufactured by Lithgow and used quite extensively by the Australians during Vietnam but very few parts kits have migrated over here to the USA this one too is a kit build on a DSA receiver this is a Lithgow pattern receiver you can tell by the lightning cut it also has a Lithgow style serial starting with AD this was built by a different friend and um, was one I really wanted for a very long time. And funny story, right as I found this L2A1, a C2 came up for sale at the same time, really for the same money. So I had to decide if I wanted to go Aussie or Canadian. I went Aussie just because of the military service and because I knew the parts kit was matching and in very good shape. Mostly it's just here at number 5 because it's a weird and unique gun and one that I wanted for a long time and it doesn't disappoint. It's actually not one we shoot too often just because it is very heavy and um, you know, I don't know. But a very nice build and a gun that is definitely in, in my collection for a good reason and not one that I would readily let go of in a hurry. 
So if you get a chance to do an L2, A1, I recommend it. They're pretty neat. And I think it's neat that um, the DSA did the correct receivers for these. So yeah, number five. The Lithgo. And unlike the Atrax, it's actually here. We'll move on. Moving on to number four, we have our first non-kit build. This is my paratrooper. This particular one was made in Argentina by FMAP. And imported by Arms Corps. And this is a 50.63 type. And by that I mean we have a folding stock. We do not have a carry handle of any kind. Standard handguard. Short sights. And we have a short barrel. This is about a 17.3, give or take, which is the shortest of the para barrels. This has the earlier so called Holland style sight. It's a protected peep, it's only windage adjustable, it doesn't have a flip. Later parasites would be flip. The stock has this typical style lock on the bottom, but it's still relatively easy to fold, even one-handed. This has the steel lower. There was a variant known as the 5064 that had an alloy lower, but interestingly those usually have the 21 inch barrel. The 63 has the folding charging handle. And it's just a small compact version FN designed for uh, paratroopers. <clears throat> Argentina would adopt the FAL on the late 50s and then they would start license production at DGFM or FMAP in Rosario and they would make pretty much all the all the models all the variants in 1982 they introduced the FSL which was their semi-auto version and uh, they would be imported by National Arms National Armament one of those I forget not arms anyway, is what I was called it. And arms core. And Pedro Belli, but in very small numbers there. Before the ban. Now after the ban, there would be some brought over as kind of half kits. They would bring over the top half and sell it. And then they would sell the bottom half and bolt from a different distributor to kind of get around the uh, 89 stuff. But... Um, those are pretty easy to tell because they're marked inside the Magwell Sackham, S A C here, Lada. And they're they actually for a very long time these Argentinian guns were a great value. They are very high quality. They're military grade. They have a typical milita military paint finish. They have kind of matte texture to the furniture. They are built on type 3 receivers but they are actually forged, they're not cast like the FN Type 3's tend to be. They were just great values, you could actually pick up a pre-ban pretty cheap for a long time, and even today they're still undervalued compared to the FN. So if you're looking for a good, you know, pre-ban factory built gun, the Argentinians should definitely be checked out along with the Imbels, but it seems like lately the Imbels have kind of shot up more than the Argentinians. These aren't still as well known. Even the post-band ones 
are excellent quality. Usually cereals won't match. The only trick there is don't pay a pre-band price for a post-band Argentinian. Just kind of know what you are getting. But if you do that, you will not be disappointed. Now, the paratrooper is at number four because it has a lot of cool points for looks. I mean, it's a 308, and look how short it is. Short little stubby barrel, relatively lightweight, very compact with the stock folded. But unfortunately, <clears throat> because the recoil system is all up in the receiver, it is a little stiffer, harder to cock, a little harder to take apart. A little more difficult there. A little bit less reliable, perhaps. But of course, the big thing is shooting with this metal stock. It's just not as comfortable as shooting with the full butt stock and rubber recoil pad. So that's something to keep in mind, but mostly it makes up for it in just the cool points of being an FAO paratrooper. So yeah, that's why it is at number four. Well, we will move on. Guys, um, just a note, for anyone into the history of these guns, we have full videos on that. Alright, with that said, number three is going to combine features of both number five and number four. We have the Argentinian FALO also known as the 50 point 41 this is another pre-band import just like number four and like number five it is a heavy barrel number five is was of course an inch pattern this is more of, of the metric pattern so this is a true FALO Pretty much an exact copy of the Belgian, with a few differences. We have the 21 inch heavy barrel. Sorry, I didn't clip on the bipod for the video, but it has a typical flash hider. It does not have the notch for a bayonet because it has a bipod, so you couldn't use it anyway. We have the big wood handguard with the exposed barrel. Exposed gas tube. We have this big honking reverse carry handle made of wood, which I find particularly cool. Oh, we do have the uh, tall front sight. It's open-eared, which I think looks really neat. And, of course, to go along with it, we have a tall rear sight. This, too, is on the same Type 3 receiver. And it has pistol grip and more or less a standard butt stock. The wood stocked versions would have a flip up butt plate, but all the polymers I've seen just have a standard polymer with the recoil pad stock, and that's probably why the wood stocks wouldn't have the recoil pad, so they probably wanted to give you a little something extra. Yeah, so Arms Corps would actually import four different versions made in Rosario. They have the standard 50. 0, .00, just your typical standard barrel FAO. They would do a Congo, which had, which was basically the same gun, but with a short 18-inch barrel and fixed stock. The paratrooper you just looked at, and uh, this heavy barrel here. And uh, this one sold for crap back in the 80s because, frankly, objectively speaking, it didn't offer anything more than the others. But it was just bigger and heavier. And people were more into shooting than collecting back then. So with that in mind, very few of these were imported. And therefore, very few were in the USA today. So when this came across, when a friend told me about this up for sale, I was uh, thrilled. And much like with the paratroopers, even though there are more FN heavy barrels in the country, many more, they still bring a lot more money than the Argentinians. So, I don't know. I have this thing for Argentine guns. I think they're neat. I think they're well made. What I like about them, 
they feel very military. Kind of, uh, I don't want to say rough and ready, but yeah, basically rough and ready. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's nice to have a gun that seems like it could have been issued in the Falklands War. The British are actually quite fond of these, too. They would capture more than a few. This was called the FAP, by the way, in Argentinian service. F-A-P. <laughs> yeah, I was really happy to get this one. Jay and I have taken it out shooting and done a video or two on it. It's a lot of fun. And I really liked it because it kind of completed my... Uh, pre-ban Argentinian collection, and I think I completed it just at the right time because it seems like after that the prices did start to go up a little bit. But if you see one of these, know that it, um, it's great quality, good chrome line barrel. I just think it has a lot of cool points going for it. The bipod these come with is it looks like a girder. It's just extremely robust. It's a little bit different from the Belgian, but extremely similar at the same time. And of course, these will feed from the 30 round mags, which look really cool, in, in addition to the standard metric 20. So, what will be next? Let's find out. Really, I go back and forth between what will be number one and number two here is my favorite FAL at least semi-auto I think both have a lot going for them and just have a lot of cool historical points but one is just a little more interesting than the other so at number two we have the Israeli light barrel FAL. Now, I think the Israeli light barrel might be a little well known today because of the recent builds that DSA has been offering built from original Israeli kits. Good guns, really good guns. This one here, though, is a pre-ban import from the 1980s. And it has a really interesting story. <clears throat> now, Israel adopted the FAL very early on in the mid-1950s. And the light barrel version was known in Hebrew as the Romat. And because Israel was an early adopter, their version had a lot of early features that would soon give way to, well, later features found on the metric. So most people think you have two types of FAL. You have the, the metric and the inch, which is true. But really, the Israeli is a bit of a special case. I mean, for the most part, they are metric. But they do have a few unique features, like the way the gas piston and, and gas plug are done. They're their own lengths. The uh, thread pitch for the barrel into the receiver is different. Of course, the furniture. We have the grill and handguard. And the buttstock has the metal ferrule on it and wood. These are kind of all holdovers from early FN versions that the Israelis kept with. Now, all the Israeli FALs were, in, were originally made in Belgium by FN. IMI in Israel never made complete FAL rifles, although they did make replacement parts. For example, this very unique front sight, this is, or I should say front sight base, is IMI. This has a 21 inch light barrel. You notice it does not have anything on the muzzle, but it does have a lug midway. That was for either a grenade launcher, a blank fire device, or of course a bayonet. And your bayonet would actually act as your flash hider, hence why it's bare. Now, later versions, they would thread the barrel and use a combination device like you see on most FALs, but early on, they would not. 
we have this very unique gas tube with these donuts on it. Pretty cool. Different. I, I love the Israeli hand guards. They are comfortable too, and they've got these metal grills. We have the Israeli uh, carry handle, which is... You, this is a unique guy on my part, where the plastic is essentially molded to the wire versus the spinning type you find on, these, on the uh, FNs. You have a tall rear sight. And like I said, you have a butt plate with a ferrule here. This would be a Type C. B's and A's would be a little different. And there's no storage compartment in the butt stock. Now, <clears throat> yeah, let's go ahead and flip it over. Let you get a look at this side, then I will. Because it does have kind of a unique lightning cut the way these were done. I'll talk about that in just a minute. As I hit my lamp with my gun. A few other things. These had forward assist caulking handles. Which is kind of neat. And they had a very unique selector. And most of your Israeli row mats were restricted to semi auto with this here selector. But their Macleons, Macleons, their heavy barrels were what they would have the full auto ability in. So, these have an interesting history as far as imports. They were actually very affordable back in the 80s. What happened to company, SBL, in Israel, obtained some FN forgings for receivers. They finished them out, and they assembled Israeli parts onto them and sold them in America. So the guns were actually built from real military service rifles. So it's kind of neat. They are a parts kit build in a way, but they're also an import. Which again, kind of like I said with the last gun, I like because it... Um, I'm going to keep hitting stuff here, aren't I? It's hard to do. <clears throat> I like that they have that military feel to them because they are real military parts the only thing we have this semi-auto receiver but it's still made from an FN forging and you'll find some that are kind of a type 3 slab side others kind of have this unique type 1 style of lightning cut a little different but it's kind of special for these guns and not very many came in Onyx and Arms Corps were the importers and um, actually, I, I met one of these guns ages ago. The same gentleman that helped me build my STG-58 had one of these. He purchased it brand new back in the 80s. And for years, I was on him to sell it to me. And the thing is, I, you know, he, it wasn't really his favorite gun. He actually said it was his least accurate FAL. But um, he never did, and then finally a friend told me about one of these up for sale a few years back, about, I don't know, 10 years ago. And I picked it up, and then I called my other friend and said, okay, I will finally stop bugging you about selling me yours, because I, I got one of my own. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I always thought they were cool. I love the old wood and steel look. And I love that this is, uh, for the most part, a true military service rifle, and since these were more or less always semi-auto in Israeli service, not being able to go full auto really doesn't lose you anything. But really, it's just a gun that I like the look and feel of. It balances well, and is a lot of fun to shoot. Well, on to number one. What will it be? All right. Number one. You excited? Should be. My number one pick, my favorite FAL of all time, is the M14. You know, I just, uh, I think the U.S. was right in 
picking this over the T48. It was clearly a superior design. That's why hundreds of nations adopted it. And uh, it stayed in U.S. service for decades. In fact, it was the longest serving military weight. That, that can't be right. That, that, can't, that can't be right. Okay, that's the last time I let my ex-Marine uh, stepbrother work on the script. Good grief. Good M14. Good yeah. Number one. For anyone who follows the channel, shouldn't be a surprise. Definitely my favorite FAL type, even though the Israeli is a close second. And I do have a love for all things Argentinian. It's my British L1A1, manufactured by BSA. And this makes it to number one for a few reasons. Probably first and most obvious, this is the real McCoy. It isn't modified, it isn't changed, it's not a kit build. It has the wear and tear to show that it was really there. This is a true surplus L1A1 SLR. Even beyond that, I kind of fell in love with the L1A1 design very early on. As soon as uh, my friend, who I call Doc, I've referenced him in a few videos, helped me get my STG-58 together. I was already looking at getting an L1A1 kit. I just thought, okay, I've got a metric, I need an inch. And there's a lot of differences. And kind of like the Israelis, Canada, Britain, and Australia adopted their FALs early on, so they do have some early features. They also had a lot of features that the Commonwealth requested. We've got this tall but folding rear sight. We've got tabs in the dust cover here. They do help stabilize it, but they're actually a leftover from when the whole front was cut back, so they could use chargers to top them off. Canada would keep using the chargers. Britain would enclose it later, but the tabs would remain. We have this uh, sand cut bolt carrier though. We have a pretty unique pattern and I've kind of got it propped on it here. Guys, uh, carry handle. We've got a tall front sight, much like the Israelis would have had and the Argentines mostly had. Still got a 21 inch kind of lightweight profile barrel. We've got that same bayonet lug flash hider. Now this has a three port flash hider, which Britain went to later on because it was stronger and a little easier to machine, but mostly because it was stronger and still effective. There's lots of little differences throughout. For example, the lightning cut. I'm not sure if I can get the camera on it, but it's a little bit different than on the Australian. The trigger guard can fold into the pistol grip. Originally these would have wood furniture, then they would go to this so-called marineal furniture. Later on, I think most all your brick guns were originally made with the wood, but they would quickly put the marineal on because this stuff is tough as nails. Uh, try and find an, an L1A1 parts kit with a broken marineal piece of furniture. I mean, the wood handguards were quite fragile. These are tough. They also do really well against heat. The pistol grip, as I said, you can fold your trigger guard into it. And the buttstock is kind of neat because you can set the length of pull. They made different uh, butt plates for these. So they had about four different sizes where you could make it longer or shorter to suit a soldier. They also have this very large change lever, as they call it. And much like the Israeli, this was a semi-auto gun in British service. That's why it was SLR, self-loading rifle. 
This was never used in the British service as a machine gun. They had the Brind and the L the L4 for that, amongst others. We have the earlier style vertical takedown. We've got kind of a unique mag release. It also interesting fe feature of the L1A1 series. They have a bolt hold open, but it's manual only. It's not automatic as on most of your metrics. And of course, a lot of these were issued with a top cover that allowed them to fit one of the suit scopes. This also has the same folding cocking handle as standard that you saw on the paratrooper. Just a cool, unique gun. I love how they shoot. I love that this is a real Milserp, not a kit build. Not even a semi-auto brought in during the 80s. What happened, a few hundred of these were allowed in for police use. And they were just Title I firearms. And in fact, they were allowed to just be straight up bought by the officers. They, were, they weren't special or anything like that. So when the officers retired, they legally could own them. And uh, they could legally sell them. And they were totally approved by the uh, Customs BTF Because again, they were always semi-auto. And mostly, truth be told, because they said so. Um, that's, that's how a lot of the legislation really boils down. If they say something's good, it's good. And um, this isn't something people are going to go out raising trouble with. I think most all of these are deep in collections now where they're appreciated and loved. All of them have wear. 70-80% finish left. Maybe 90 if you're lucky. That's because these are true surplus guns. Pretty much sold off after they went to the L85. So yeah, it definitely makes it to my number one because it checks all the right boxes. I have a British collection. I love my infields, got some Sten guns. I love surplus guns in general. I love the FAL. And moreover, not just from a collector standpoint, I like how this feels and shoots. It's not too heavy or bulky. And since these do all have some wear to them, they're not safe points. They're not guns you're going to worry about putting an extra scuff or scratch on. So go out, shoot them, enjoy them. Alrighty, folks, that is my top six FALs. Nothing too new here. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in more of a history, we have several videos. In fact, we have a full playlist dedicated to the FAL. So check that out. Appreciate you tuning in. We'd love to hear about your own favorite FALs, or maybe even least favorite. I mean, Jay hasn't had the best experiences with them. I think my Argentine guns have started to turn the tide with him, but early on he just did not have great luck. <laughs> so yeah, appreciate it, of course. And if you could, check out the link to our Patreon page. Well, this is Misha. And we will catch you very soon next time.